Welcome to Concordia Online. I'm Greg, I'm the pastor here at Concordia, and I just want to say welcome and thank you for joining us on this Good Friday. Uh, it is Good Friday, but remember, Easter is coming, right? Sunday is right around the corner. And so what I, wa I want to invite you to join us for uh, one of our Easter celebrations. Of course, we're online and we'll be, we'll be having this online. Uh, so if this is how you join us, fantastic. And we're, we're glad you, that you'll be joining us this way. If you choose to join us in person, uh, we'd love to have you. Uh, we are uh, taking the safety precautions, social distancing, and wearing of masks. Uh, we offer two worship services on Sunday, an 815 traditional worship and a 1030 contemporary. So if you feel... Um, uh, comfortable and you'd like to join us there, that's great. If not, of course, um, we'll be here celebrating the risen Christ. But before we get to the risen Christ, we have to get to the sacrificial Christ. We have to get to Jesus' death. Um, and that's a heavy subject, isn't it? That Jesus, the righteous Son of God, the one who was without sin, gave his life for us, for sinners. He gave us his righteousness and took upon himself our unrighteousness. He is the one who makes us sons and daughters of God. It is by his sacrifice that we receive by grace salvation, right? By grace through faith we receive salvation through Jesus' shed blood on the cross. Amazing. And that's what we'll focus on here tonight. Join me in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Good Friday, and, and it is, Father, it is a good Friday, but that word, that word fits and yet doesn't fit both at the same time. Uh, it's good, it is so good, and that word pales, Lord, to say it's good Friday. It's, it's a great Friday for us because on this day, Jesus gave his life for us, uh, something we don't, didn't, <laughs> do not deserve, Jesus did for us. He died our death that we might live forever. He suffered such agony such such loneliness, such suffering, such death, as we will never, ever know. No one throughout history will ever know. Lord, he suffered that on, on our behalf. We, so in that sense, Lord, I mean, it's good, and yet it's not good that the, the righteous Son of God should suffer in that way, but we are grateful. We are eternally grateful for this, this awesome gift, Father, the gift of new life through Jesus, the one who gave his life that we might live. Thank you for this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on, on uh, this day on Good Friday, we're still going through our series on the Gospel of Mark following the servant. Uh, and of course, today we're in chapter 15. Um, the, the verses we'll be reading are chapter 15, verses 16 through 47. I normally give out points for having uh, your, your Bible with you. Um, I don't know, somehow that just doesn't, doesn't seem quite right right now. So uh, no points today. Um, but I hope you have your Bible there, um, and I hope you take your notes and you read through it, uh, and you take in what God is saying to us today. So let's read our text. Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16. <clears throat> the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and, thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. Dividing up his, clo his clothes, they cast lots to see which would get, wh what each would get. It was the third hour when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, The king of the Jews. They crucified two robbers with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, So, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, come down from the cross and save yourself. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked him among themselves. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Let, the, let this Christ, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At the start of the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, 
which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus, Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in linen, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. <clears throat> With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The end. Evil wins. Death remains undefeated. Even, even the next two occurrences after Jesus dies, seems to, they seem to acknowledge defeat. I mean, the curtain tearing in two uh, seems to be creation lamenting the very fact that what it thought was his hero, right? The, the hero come to redeem all of God's creation has now died, and so lamenting the fact, it, in fact, it tears itself. And, and the centurion, the words he utters, they, they, they could be taken as words of resignation when he says, surely this man was, was, the Son of God, but obviously, obviously not. It's over. But what if? What if the death of Jesus isn't the end? What if these two events that occur right after Jesus dies, what if they're not a declaration of defeat, right? An acknowledgement of, of defeat, but a declaration of victory? What if God wins. So I don't know if you know this, but at the temple, um, well, <laughs> when it was there, uh, the temple in Jerusalem had two curtains, right? It had the, the outer curtain, which was uh, at the, the, the court of Israel, and then it had the inner curtain, uh, which was at the Holy of Holies. Now, in our text for today, it, it's pretty ambiguous in the Greek in terms of which curtain is being talked about there. Is it the inner curtain or the outer curtain? And, and, a, and great cases can be made for, for either one, right? Either the, the inner or the outer. And great cases can be made um, by, by all sorts of people, right? And theologians over the centuries have debated, which curtain is this? And, and they base these arguments off of, of, off of great, um, great work or great historical work, great, great biblical work, um, great theological work, right? They, they, you can make great cases for both of these things. Biblically, linguistically, theologically, uh, I tend to lean on it's the outer curtain, right? And, 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 and we'll, we'll, we'll go through that. And I think what we'll see, and I know what we'll see, is as, as that outer curtain comes down, we see that the, the inner curtain, which also poses a, poses a barrier, uh, is taken down as well by the blood uh, and the righteousness, the death of Jesus. So why do I think, then, it's the outer curtain? Well, uh, for, for a lot of reasons, which we'll get into. Um, but the, the one reason I want to start with is because of the, uh, the description of it by the Jewish historian Josephus, a historian of the time, uh, back in the day. Here's what Josephus, uh, here's how he describes the curtain as he saw it. He says, but these, and when he says these, he's talking about the doors um, to the temple. And these doors were about 82 feet high and about 24 feet wide. These are massive doors. And he says, but these, these doors, um, or before these doors, was an equal length veil. So imagine how big this, this veil. And he says here, um, an equal length veil, a, um, a, Bibli a Babylonian curtain, tapestry. So it had to be 82 by 24 um, uh, feet wide, embroidered out of blue and linen and both scarlet and purple, 
Uh, and he says, and the curtain tapestry was inscribed with all the heavenly spectacle, except the zodiac. So these, these curtains are embroidered with, were a picture of the heavens themselves. And, and these heavens now are, are, are torn apart, right? Are torn from top to bottom. The heavens are torn from top to bottom. Uh, and that word there, that word torn, that's pretty important because that's the same exact word that Mark uses at the start of his gospel back in chapter 1. And, and that's going to play into this. So let's go back to chapter 1 and take a look at that. So Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 9, says this, At the time, at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open. So he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Don't miss the significance here. At the baptism of Jesus, at the start of his ministry, the very heavens, we're told, are torn open. The heavens are torn open, and the Spirit descends from there upon Jesus. And the voice the Father calls out, saying, You are my Son, whom I love. In other words, this is, right? You are my Son, the Son of God whom I love. God has entered into our world. And yet, as John says in, in, in his gospel, in the first chapter, he says, yeah, he came into the world, but the world didn't recognize him. Right? And that's what we see is if you've been with us through the gospel of Mark, through our study in Mark, you see that to be the case. Right? You, you see that the people don't recognize him for who he is. In fact, those closest to him, right? his disciples, man, they seem to really miss the boat. Those who should have really known him, they, they don't see him for who he is. And those people who sort of know him, right, are the, the outsiders, the outliers, the, the marginalized, the minor characters, and they only sort of get him. They don't fully understand who Jesus is. And now here at the death of Jesus, with the heavens once again literally and figuratively being torn from top to bottom, we have a new voice calling out. It's not the voice of the Father, but this time it is the voice of his creation. It is the voice of the centurion confessing what no human, what no human has confessed up till now about Jesus, that Jesus is indeed the Son of God. Wow, right? The, the, the symbolism, the reality that is here is overwhelming and life-changing. Again, don't miss this. Where is, where is the God of the universe finally seen? Where is the maker of heaven and earth finally confessed by his creation? Where is the deepest, fullest, most profound uh, 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 revelation of God? It's here. It's here at the cross. The world. The world wonders. We wonder at times where is God right where is God in the midst of tragedy that goes on all around us where is God when 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 cancer strikes where is God in the midst of a pandemic where is God in our suffering in our sorrow in our pain where is God when my sin is crushing and death looms large where is God we cry out he's here He's here at the cross. He has entered into our suffering. He knows our sorrow. The violent disease of sin is upon him. And with our crushing sin upon his shoulders through his death, Jesus deals death a decisive blow. Toward the end of the movie, The Wizard of Oz, which I'm sure uh, you've seen, if not, um, you're a little behind the times. Um, but in the, in the closing, not the closing scenes, but towards the end of the movie, uh, the, the curtain that hides the, the powerful, the all-powerful Wizard of Oz, right? The curtain's torn away, and what's revealed there is, a, is an impotent, fraudulent man, right? Who, who's, who's frantically pulling these levers, and what we find out is it's all smoke and mirrors. He's nothing. He has no power. He, he's a fraud. And yet here, by contrast... As this, at the death of Jesus, when, when this temple curtain is torn away, what we see is not some impotent, fraudulent uh, 
man, what we see here is an all-powerful, all-loving God who gave everything to redeem his people. In our text, if we go back there, we see that the, the religious leaders, right, the rulers, were crying out to him, saying, he saved others, but he can't save himself, as Jesus hung dying there on the cross, mocking what appeared to them to be some, some impotent, fraudulent wizard. But instead, God was revealing, as Scripture tells us, and the New Testament writers and witnesses proclaim that God wants all people to be saved. So he himself bore our sins in his body, not counting people's sins against them, that we might live. Therefore, yes, Jesus did indeed save others, others all people, precisely because he did not save himself. And in choosing, in choosing to sacrifice himself as a ransom for many, the curtain was torn and the veil was lifted for everyone to see. You see, that outer curtain, that was the curtain that everyone saw. Everyone could see this curtain. No one, but the priest could see the, the inside one. But everyone could see this barrier. Everyone could see what it was there to do. And it was there to keep out the Gentile, right? The outcast, the outlier, the marginalized, those who were not worthy. It was meant to keep them out. But now that curtain, that barrier is gone. And now all can come. All have access. Are you broken? Are you lonely? Are you, are you, are you an addict, an adulterer, a liar, a gossip? Are you filled with lust? Are you feeling hopeless and helpless? Are you wanting freedom, but bound by, by the chain of sin and regret? Are you wanting to believe that there is more than this life, but afraid there isn't? Are you wanting to believe that you are indeed loved? Are you wanting to believe that, that the words grace and forgiveness are more than just words of a bygone era, Era, then come, right? Come. The curtain has been torn. The heavens have been torn. The Son of God himself has been revealed. God has entered into our struggles, into our sorrow, into our despair. The one who chose not to save himself brings us freedom, forgiveness, grace, life, love. And it's not just the outer curtain that has been torn away as a witness to the world of God's great love, but it's also the inner curtain that's been torn away by the, by the power and the blood of Jesus. That curtain has also been removed. Go with me to Hebrews. Here's what the writer of Hebrews says. Starting in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, he writes, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, right? So the Holy of Holies, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. Right? Jesus has torn away that inner curtain too, by his body. And since we have a great high priest, Jesus, over the house of God, let us draw near to God. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Just as God has revealed himself to us and come to us in his son Jesus, the very son of God, so now he invites us to come to him, to step into his presence with the full assurance of faith that what Jesus has won for us is indeed real. It is indeed real life forgiveness, salvation, hope, love, and life. This is what he has won for us. This is what Jesus has made possible for us through his death on the cross. So let me ask you, what's holding you back? What is the barrier that's keeping you from experiencing all that Jesus has won for you on the cross? What is keeping you from confessing that Jesus is indeed Lord and Savior, the very Son of God? What is keeping you from picking up your cross and following him? <coughs> Excuse me, the curtain's been torn away by the uncondition unconditional, unrelenting, unfathomable love of God found in Jesus Christ for you, for all people, for all time. Praise God. Praise God for the victory that is ours in Jesus 
the one who has torn away the curtain, that we all now have life, salvation, and forgiveness through him and his shed blood for us. Now before we end, I want to tell you about one more, one more barrier. One more barrier to be overcome. It's a stone. A stone rolled in front of a temple. Uh, I'm sorry, in front of a tomb. This is evil's final tactic. It's Satan's last-ditch effort for, for victory. It's death's final frantic attempt at defeat. i got to tell you, though, it doesn't stand a chance. And that's probably enough for tonight. Go with God's blessing. 